You're very welcome to this month's AWARE webinar, Supporting the Supporters. We're delighted to have you and we're just going to wait a few moments for as many people as possible to get in. Just check the numbers. Great, well, we'll start off. My name is Claire Hayes. I'm the clinical director with AWARE and I'm delighted to welcome you to August. It's not actually August, it's September. I was getting muddled there. So. It's September Supporting the Supporters webinar. And we have on our panel today, I'm delighted to welcome Joe Parlin and his wife, Mary Parlin, and Mary Parlin and her husband, Joe, whichever is more politically correct to say, mm -hmm. and Bree Jamara. And any of you who are familiar with AWARE will absolutely be delighted to welcome Bree back into AWARE's fold again. And just to give you a little bit of introduction on AWARE first before I come to introduce our speakers properly. AWARE, as you might know, is Ireland's national organization to support people who have depression or bipolar disorder. It's a great organization. There's lots of services available. I encourage you to look at the website. We have a support lines, support mail. There are courses that I'm going to come back to talk to you at the end based on cognitive behavioral therapy. And particularly relevant to today's webinar, AWARE has a course supporting relatives and Breed is very involved in running those and designing it, developing it, and will give us a lot of information on that. So we encourage you to ask questions and I, we will do our best. I'm working with a backup support team and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we possibly can. But we strongly encourage you that if there are questions that we haven't addressed to contact us afterwards, or if, there are, if you're feeling distressed in any way from this, to please contact your GP, it's really, really important. So that's the housekeeping bit out of the way. And I'd like to formally welcome Joe and Mary and Mary and Joe and Breach. And I'm saying Joe and Mary and Mary and Joe because they come as a double act. And we'll be speaking to them in a few moments. And actually, if I can introduce you first and then I come to you, Breach, if that's okay. So Mary and Joe, you describe yourselves as dairy farmers. Aware describes you as lived experience experts. We're delighted to have you here. And I know, Joey, that you have had experience of depression in the past. And Mary, you have supported Joe. One of the most common questions we get is from people who are really concerned about people they love and they want to, or care about, and they want to know how best to support them. So just give you a few moments to introduce yourselves and then I'll introduce Breed and then I'll come back to talk to you in a little bit more detail. Hi, well, my name is Mary Parlin. Um, we're dairy farmers uh, in County Offaly. Um, we're married 33 years. Um, I work or try to help on the farm, paperwork and that. Um, and I suppose um, we have three sons, um, all grown up now. And thankfully our youngest son is back farming with us. Um, People will know farming is a um, seven day a week job and particularly dairy farming, you're very tied with cows. Springtime is particularly um, busy and can be stressful. Weather, calving, all the issues that crop up. Um, so um, I suppose we do try to work as a team, um, but when Joe um, started to show symptoms in 2006. We were probably ignorant to the initial signs and, um, you know, symptoms like um, anxiety, um, couldn't sleep. Um, Mary, I'm going, I'm going to interrupt you there for a moment, if you don't mind, because I want to do two things. I want to just remind our backup team that the um, screen, the initial slide is still on the screen. 
So maybe if they can change that, brilliant. Thank you very much so that we can see you better. And so I'm going to come back to all of that, Mary, in a few moments. But Joe, if you'd just like to say an initial hello, and then we'll let Breed say hello, and then I'll come back to both of you. Yeah, um, Joe Parlin. Um, I suppose I had two bad episodes of, of uh, depression over the years, 2006 and again in 2016. So um, um, we had a fantastic understanding of it in 2016, but uh, in 2006, uh, it frightened the life out of me and it frightened the life out of Mary as well. So um, that's uh, that's just that's just the introduction to it. That's yeah. great. So that's setting a context. So that's what we're going to be looking at, how you, Mary, helped Joe's um, helped him with that and also Joe how you helped Mary with her concerns around supporting you because it's it's a two-way thing thank you and then Breach, you're listed as a well-being consultant we know you as AWARE's former director of services you're a psychotherapist we're delighted to have you so if you'd like to give a, a brief introduction in terms of what what you would like to, where, where you are at right now in terms of this conversation today Okay, so I'm delighted to be part of this conversation today because, as you say, I was director of services with AWARE for a number of years, and uh, one of my principal projects when I was in that role was to develop a program for people who are supporting loved ones experiencing depression and bipolar disorder. Um, I did that because my background is in mental health nursing. I trained as a psychiatric nurse straight from school, and um, all the way through my nursing career, I was dealing with relatives coming to visit their loved ones in hospital. Um, and could see the distress that they were experiencing while all the care was being given to the person experiencing the depression or bipolar. And I suppose I felt that there was a strong need there to help the person supporting their loved one because they play such a pivotal role. And if we look at over the last, you know, 30 years, the way mental health treatment has changed in Ireland. And back in the 80s and 90s, you know, people were hospitalized for long periods of time. And now that's not the case. You know, people are more supported in the community and encouraged to stay well at home, which is really, really positive. And I think it's a fantastic move in mental health. However, it also puts extra um, stresses and responsibilities on the people supporting them at home. So I felt really strongly about that and that there needed to be more support for people. I felt that loved ones needed to understand the conditions. So what is depression? How does it manifest? Why does it manifest the way it does? What is bipolar disorder? You know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about bipolar disorder, and I really wanted to address them so that people could understand them. And then to look at tools, skills, techniques that are really helpful for people who are supporting a lot of Breed, may I, may I put you on hold for, for the moment, if you like, because I know people watching will want to know what are those tools. Yep. And I'm just really grateful to you for being here, but also Mary and Joe for putting your own story forward. And I just really want to acknowledge how, how brilliant that is. I was talking to someone recently and, and the, the person was quite dismissive about people telling their own stories. It was like, oh, they're celebrities and we can't relate to them. And, and you two might become celebrities from this, but that's not, that's not the reason you're doing it. You two are two very, in quotes, ordinary, and I don't mean that as in a disrespectful way at all, but you're very open in, in sharing your story. And I know you want to do that. So maybe if you can talk to us about why you want to take part in this webinar and what you would like people to know about what it's like to support someone who's experiencing depression. Yeah, well, I suppose just going back to, to my depression and uh, I suppose the spring cabin every year always put a certain amount of stress on me and sure look stress can be good too and, and it heightens your awareness and that but uh, in 2006 uh, in a matter of three weeks I suppose I went from being stressed to being the full-blown depression and um, I suppose I, I like to say how it affects you physically and mentally in a short period of time and I suppose the physical part of it was I couldn't eat. And I'm one that loves me food. I couldn't eat. And um, I, 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 in fact, I lost two stone in six weeks. And uh, I couldn't sleep at night time. And uh, um, uh, I was waking up at half three in the morning. And this the springtime of the year, you're shocking busy on the farm. And you have to be going all the time. And everything was spinning around in my head. And by the time the clock went off at seven o'clock in the morning, I was in a ball of sweat 
and I was just unable to do what I should be uh, should be doing. And um, uh, that's the physical part. The, the mental part of it then, and, and I do call it sort of mental torture, uh, that everything is spinning around in your head. Um, always, I was always a very confident fella, and all of a sudden I lost my confidence uh, uh, completely. And uh, I decision making, I couldn't make decisions. And as a dairy farmer, you have to make decisions every hour, not to talk about every day. And I couldn't make a decision because is it right? Is it wrong? Everything was spinning around. And uh, um, I stand up good and straight. And next thing, all of a sudden, it was like as if something was forcing me down. I had a bend in my back, I had a lump in my stomach. I was in a mess. In, in a matter of two to three weeks, uh, I went from a confident guy to a, a, a complete uh, mess. And um, I suppose, lucky enough, um, I could talk to Mary about it and tell her the way I was feeling. And uh, um, from the start, after two weeks of it, I went to the doctor. And in fact, for 12 weeks, I went every two weeks for those 12 weeks. And uh, he put me on antidepressants and up me medication. And uh, it was worse I was getting. And um, of course, Mary couldn't understand it. It was frightening the life out of both of us. But uh, uh, I think what was a huge help was that I could talk to Mary about it and she knew the way I was feeling. And I think that's one of the huge issues of mental health is talking about it. And because um, a, a good lot of people comes to me now and, and um, nobody can tell or very few can, can tell how they're feeling or want to tell. And the whole stigma is there about, um, well, it's all right if I had any other illness, but mental health, uh, mental illness is something that uh, you shouldn't have or um, you, you can't deal with. Um, so th th just maybe Mary's point of view then uh, is very important then because... Yeah, ab absolutely, Joe. I was just going to ask that. Mary, how were you in the initial stages and afterwards? <laughs> Yeah, initially, like, I could see the physical changes in him, um, you know, trying to cook food that he'd eat and take two spoonfuls and leave it aside. That in itself would be kind of frustrating. Um, you know, seeing him change hugely personality-wise, uh, he went from someone that's always on the go, bubbly, to hardly getting a word out of him, kind of had to... to you know, constantly probe him to even talk about how he was feeling. And then in my quieter moments, I was lost as to what am I going to do? I was clutching at straws. Um, we're hugely thankful for having a, a very, um, you know, nice GP that was very open with us, very willing to, to you know, see us at short notice. Um, do realize that medication is part of the treatment, but it doesn't work instantly. And like what Joe said, you know, even though he was on the medication for a few weeks, he, if you like, felt worse before he started to feel better. Um, at that time, our sons were quite young. Um, I do realize now that possibly I was trying to shield them from what was going on. And maybe one regret was that I didn't talk to him as much. Um, you know, I was kind of saying that, you know, daddy is sick at the moment, but he'll get better and that. But I didn't have the answers. Um, Mary, Mary, may I ask you, did you have at that time a sense of wanting or needing or looking for support for yourself? It sounds like your focus was very much on supporting yeah. Joe. But did you have um, any awareness of for you? Um, I suppose I kind of um, didn't dwell on that, but I do remember, you know, after his period in um, St. Pat's and when he was on the road to recovery and starting to come back to the Joe, I knew with his energy levels, you know, building up and he starting to enjoy life again. I, my energy levels just hit the floor and where he was starting to get enthusiastic or oh, we'll do this and we'll do that. All I could think about how soon can I crawl into bed? So I think I suffered later on in the process. I 
I burnt the candle at both ends while I had to, but I would have, um, you know, had repercussions, you know, later on in the year. Now, that was I, my I, I, feeling. I, I see Breed nodding, so I'm going to come to you in a second, Breed. But Joe, did you have an awareness of the impact that your challenges were having on Mary? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that really annoyed Mary at the time was the springtime of the year, if someone drove into the yard, I started to hide in the sheds and wouldn't come out and they'd have to go into Mary. And Mary knew I was out in the yard and that I wouldn't, that really uh, annoyed Mary at the time. And, uh, um, but look, I was trying to avoid people. And I just say, I suppose when I did go to the doctor, I think it was hugely important that Mary came with me every time. Yeah. Um, she was part of, I won't say no, she was part of the problem, but she was nearly part of the illness. And, and uh, she needed to know from the doctor what was going on uh, as well as, as I did. And she came every time uh, yeah. we uh, went to the doctor in those 12 weeks. I, I possibly felt that he was just, um, not able to express uh, fully on a day-to-day -day thing, you know, the the routine that he was turning into as regards just no energy and that. And while the doctor was good at listening and suggesting try this, try that, I really had to emphasize to the doctor, look at, you know, he probably would have slept all day, only he knew he had to get up and uh, you know, tend to something on the farm. I could see, I suppose, that the farm was um, starting to slip in while we managed to milk a cows and that, but all the extra jobs that needs planning in the springtime, uh, particularly in 2006, was being left, uh, you know, so um, just that was a huge worry for me. And thankfully, I had my brother and other family members that stepped in and offered to help. I wouldn't have been that open asking for help as readily in, in the first episode because we were both so um, new to this experience that we were lost. And, uh, you know, um, that was, I did feel, and he was more than willing for me to go to the appointments. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say, and I suppose maybe with going into the doctor as well, that one of the things that, that started to happen to me was uh, being so forgetful. And uh, I was great for turning on taps to fill buckets of water, or drums of water for cows or calves, but I never think of turning it off. So there was always water spilling. So like when you went to the doctor and he, when he threw things out at you, it was gone out of my head 10 minutes later. Like I couldn't remember. And that's yeah. one of the things. Uh, uh, I couldn't just hold stuff anymore. It, it sounds to me really, really clearly from how you're both describing that your role, Mary, changed a lot, that there was extra, extra pressure that you were putting on yourself in terms of supporting Joe. So Breach, I could see your head nodding a lot. And Joe and Mary, when you were going through this, there wasn't an awareness support program for relatives. But Breach, if you could tell us about what what's striking you from listening to Mary and Joe speak, but also what suggestions you would have from your own experience and particularly from the AWARE program for relatives and friends in terms of how Mary retrospectively, but other people who are going through this now could get support for themselves. Okay, so there's two, two, two components to that question. Firstly, I think to say like what Mary and Joe are describing is, is really bringing the experience of depression and the experience of living with somebody with depression to life. And I think it's amazing to listen to them because if you think of the festival symptoms that AWARE use, I think Joe has described probably six of them really clearly there as to how it felt for him. But Mary then is describing- Sorry, sorry I'm, going to, I'm going to interrupt you there because a lot of people listening might not know what the festival symptoms are. Okay. So if you could just give us a quick synopsis okay. of those, please. Okay. So the festival symptoms are uh, an acronym we use to describe depression and the symptoms of depression. So F stands for feelings. E stands for energy. So we're hearing Joe talk about how he felt. We're talking about he's describing lack of energy. The S stands for sleep. 
So he's talking about his disturbed sleep, waking up at three o'clock in the morning. And then Mary also describing him staying in bed all day. He would only get up if. So disturbed sleep, any change to a normal sleep pattern. The T stands for thoughts. So we're hearing Joe describe how he couldn't concentrate, how he'd turn on the tap to fill a bucket of water and forget to turn it off. And how it, it was really important that Mary came to appointments with him because he might come out of that uh, doctor's appointment and not be able to remember what had happened in there, okay? So thoughts. I stands for interests. And while Joe hasn't mentioned his own interests there, I, I would expect your interests were impacted, Joe, were they? Yeah. Things that normally gave you joy or gave you pleasure, okay? The V stands for value for self, okay? So Joe talked about people coming to the house and he disappearing into the shed. So he didn't want to talk to them. So was that to do with your self-value, Joe? Was that to do with your ability to be able to communicate with people and have a conversation with them? Self-value can impact us in a number of ways. So the V stands for value for self. The A stands for aches and pains because a lot of people experience depression very somatically. You heard Joe there saying there was physical and mental aspects to his depression. For some people, that can be headaches, it can be neck aches, it can be back aches, it can be digestive complaints, it can be, you know, a lot of stomach problems. And then the L is interest in living. And sadly, we know that for a lot of people who experience depression, they sometimes have thoughts of ending their life by suicide. Sometimes they make plans, and very sadly, sometimes they complete their plan. So there are eight symptoms, eight festival symptoms. And what, what we would say in AWARE is that you have five or more symptoms for two weeks or more that you should really be going to see your doctor, to have a chat with your GP about what's happening. I recommend to people all the time, go onto the AWARE website, have a look at the festival symptoms. Let that be your first conversation with the doctor. Use the festival symptoms to start the conversation because it can be very difficult for people to go into their GP and try to explain how they're feeling. But when you look at the festival symptoms and you can go into your GP and say, look, AWARE uses festival and I'm feeling this, my energy is depleted, my sleep is disturbed, my thinking and my concentration is gone. Do you know what I mean? That you can use that to explain what it feels like. Great, I'm, I, I, I'm going to stop you just for, for two moments and then I'll, mm -hmm. I'll come back. And um, one is, I remember when I came across festival and Dr. McKeown developed the, the acronym, I remember it jarring with me initially, depression, festival, but then the more I, I understood it, I just think it's such an amazing word. And if you think yes. of at a festival and, you know, we haven't had a lecture picnic, but when people go to festivals, the Samaritans actually have outreach people to go yes. because a festival is somewhere where we might expect people to feel in great form. And yes. actually it could be times where people aren't. So I think it's, it's a great word for that. The yes. second thing is I just like to remind all the participants to the webinar if you have any questions to write them in the chat box they will only be visible to ourselves and um, Jamie in the in the back room and Karen will deal with them and, and send them to me and, and we'll have a look at it so Breed I interrupted you and I interrupted you with the festival but I think it's That's so okay no I think, it's, yeah. I think it's really, really good to clarify it yeah yes. I think then Mary also talked about how her focus initially was all on Joe and keeping the farm going and protecting the boys Sorry, Breed. One, sorry, I know I keep interrupting you. I've messed that's up okay. here. Jamie's just come to remind me that it's not the chat box I want people to write in because that's actually blocked. It's a question and answer block. So I promise I will keep quiet and let you speak. That's okay, Claire. No problem at all. Okay. So just to say what, what I heard Mary uh, describing her focus was on Joe's health, on the farm, and in looking after the boys and protecting the boys. So really, Mary wasn't coming into the picture herself at all. All her focus was external. Is everybody else okay? Is the farm keeping going? How am I going to support Joe? How do I protect the boys? Daddy isn't well at the moment, he'll be fine soon. But she was carrying it, okay? So we all know that, Joe mentioned at the beginning, you know, stress can be good for us. Stress sometimes, um, you know, it, it, it spurs us on to do things. It motivates us, it, it, you know, it keeps us active. But generally when we have a stress, there's a challenge, we respond and then we recover. So challenge, response, recover. But when you're uh, experiencing a stress over a long period of time, you're not getting that opportunity to recover. So what Mary describes is her, that, that ongoing stress of Joe not being well over months, trying to keep the farm going over months, 
trying to protect the boys over months and not really giving much time to her own self-care, that then Mary became depleted. And when things started to improve and Joe started to get better and that very busy spring period had passed on the farm, maybe a breath to take towards the end of the summer before you head into the autumn, boys maybe finish summer and going back to school and suddenly, and then you go to recover, but you realize that the tank is empty. So in, in aware, and again, in the program that I developed, we talk about it being like an oxygen cylinder. That when you go on an airplane, if there's a sudden change in air pressure, you're told that the oxygen mask is going to drop in front of you. And you're advised to put on your own oxygen mask first before you help anybody else. Because if you can't breathe yourself, you're not in a position to help anybody else. So what, what I was trying to develop in the, in the Relatives and Friends program was an oxygen mask for people so that they would learn to keep themselves in the picture, practice some self-care, give themselves an opportunity to recover. So having the challenge, having the response, but some recovery and then to be able to keep themselves going. Because as we know, if, you know, if we have somebody in our family who maybe has, has to go into hospital for an appendix operation, we know that they go in, they have their appendix removed, they come home, there's a period of recuperation, and then it's over. It doesn't work like that with mental illness. It, mental illness can be longer. And we don't always know, it's not like we know that in six days time, I'm going to feel better. As Joe and Mary both described, when they started, when he, Joe started an antidepressants, it took time. He felt worse initially, and then he felt better. So there's a, there's a time period there. And self-care is so important during that period. But because we're, we're kind of programmed really, aren't we, to look after other people, that we don't tend to think about looking after ourselves. And if we think of Buddhist philosophy and compassion, when the Buddhists wrote about compassion first, they talked about compassion for self and others in periods of distress, emotional distress. In the Western world, we tended to drop the self piece and compassion became about other people. And we don't put a lot of priority on self-care. So a lot of the focus of the program is, like I say, skills, tools and techniques, but also on that focus of self-care. Because if I don't look after myself, my oxygen cylinder depletes and then I have an empty tank. And if I can't breathe, how can I look after anybody else? You know, that makes so much sense, Bridge. And again, I love your clarity in explaining that. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to check with Joe and Mary, with, with both of you. Um, I was thinking as you were speaking, Breach, that there was a period where the supporter support person changed. So that when you were becoming better, if I, you can use that word, Joe, and Mary was becoming more depleted, which is a great word, your roles kind of changed. So then you were into supporting Mary. And, and I know from sometimes people tell me that then they feel very guilty and they blame themselves that they, you know, that they've caused this. So it's so important for us to really look after ourselves when we're looking after anyone else. Mary, if I can ask you, what, how does it resonate with you what Breach is saying? And how did you take care of yourself during that time? Well, I suppose I can concur with everything Breed is saying, but I wasn't um, aware of the importance of the oxygen looking after okay. myself. I suppose I was kind of saying, oh, just let me get through each day and maybe tomorrow I won't be as busy or, you know, um, I didn't really participate in anything that I would say was my time. Um, just all I craved was an hour to myself, you know, that I liked my garden, but I wouldn't have spent the time I normally like to spend in it. I like to go for walks, but at that particular time, you know, if I managed 20 minutes, but it wasn't, it was kind of a rush job as opposed to a relaxation. Um, I would have, um, I just muddled my way through it because I didn't understand the importance of it, particularly in 2006. Mm. Our experience in 2016 was possibly better on a lot of fronts. First of all, once the initial symptoms started, we kind of said, well, we're going to make sure this time that, you know, things won't deteriorate. 
and as hard as both ourselves and the doctor tried and be proactive and all fronts, once that course of that grip of depression or dark cloud started to descend, um, you know, we were fighting against the odds, really. But look, at, I was much more prepared in 2016, having had the experience in 2006. Our sons were of a different age group um, and were willing and able to take over the full responsibility of the farm. So that was one less pressure and decision making that I had to be involved in as much. Um, you know, and I would say in 2016, while he had to go into St. Pat's again for the recovery, um, that time freed up. Uh, I was confident and happy for him to go, that I had done as much as I felt able. And uh, so his weeks in St. Pat's allowed me back some of my time that I could sleep properly, I could get in my bit of exercise just get involved with life again and know that he was being, he was on the road to recovery. Yeah, I, I just said that I remember in 2006 when, when I came home and um, um, I sort of said to Mary, well, now, if anyone's ringing, I don't want to talk to him, but everyone was ringing to know is, how is Joe and how is he going? And I remember Mary got fixed one day and she says, would anyone ever ring and know how I am? Yeah. And um, I think it was, it, it sort of, it brought it to me that, that look, Mary was definitely, uh, she was stressed out at that stage, like, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I, when you see Pressure me put my glasses on, I'm, all list, family I'm listening. Members. Yeah. When, when you see me put my glass on, I'm listening, but I'm also responding to some of the, the, the questions, recognizing oh, some of the questions that come in. So apologies for that if I, if I seem to be slightly distracted. Yeah. But there, there are questions yeah. that are coming in that I'd, that I'd just like to ask you this one. And it's just something that Breed mentioned around Mary was looking after everyone else but herself. And it's somebody who's saying she was in the same situation and she feels like she can't get out of that routine, even now when things are much better. Very and, awesome. Yeah. And, her, her question for you, Mary, is how did you deal with that? And did you talk to someone or did you just muddle through? Well, certainly I would say I muddled through in 2006. Um, now, I'm lucky I had the support of my immediate family, sisters and brother. Um, but I wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to, or feel confident to go and speak directly with maybe people that had been through it. Uh, because of the stigma, um, you know, um, while I, my neighbours were good at stepping in when they probably realised that oh, that field should have been grazed or topped or whatever farming issue that should have been done, they came and offered physical help. But um, I'm quite sure behind the scenes, a lot of people were kind of saying, God, what's wrong with Joe Parlin? He's disappeared off the face of the earth and he would have been very involved in community and meetings and GA scene and everything like that. And he literally had to step back from all that to try and heal himself first and relieve himself of meetings and that that caused him huge pressure if he got notification of a meeting coming up next week. He just knew himself he wasn't able to participate in it. So it was better to be upfront and honest and say, look, I need a break for a while. I will be back. Yes. Well, it just, I remember coming out of St. Pat's and the consultant said, God, you're involved in an awful lot of things. Um, and I said to him, look, sure, should I pull back from all these things? And I remember him saying, and it always stuck with me afterwards, that uh, he says, if going out to a meeting, you say to yourself, oh God, I hate going to this. I dread, you know, uh, maybe it's time to pull away from that. But if you get enjoyment from something, you should stay at it. And in fact, I gave up that day going to GA meetings because I was chairman of the local club for a long period of time and uh, it turned in nothing on any stress. And uh, I decided that was it, no more GA meetings. But I'm still involved in IFA and drama and a lot of different things. But um, I remember that stuck with me. If going out to a meeting, you decide that, look, this is only going to put stress on me, well, then maybe it's time to be pulling away from that. 
I, I'm going to come back to both of you in, in a few moments because I'm conscious as I'm listening to you that you've spoken about 2006 and 2016 and you know we're heading into 2026 and I'm just wondering if you have a how you manage on a day-to-day -day basis if you have a sense of dread or anticipation but before so I'll let you think about that as a, as a question and in terms of how you support each other now and yourselves but we've we've a few questions and um Breach, there's one here about what can you do when the unwell person, in this case, someone's daughter, seeks her help and shows her more of the distress than she's showing to the GP or the counsellor and then punishes the mum and the, her, the daughter, the two of them, for it. And she just says she's very lonely and she's been told that she has her support and she just says her leaning on me may be, way, may be getting in the way of her owning it. So she's very lonely, yet I have been told, sorry, apologies, that this lady who wrote in has been told that giving her support and allowing her daughter lean on her may actually be getting in the way of her owning it. And what can we do when our support is maybe part of the problem? And you were the ideal person to answer this. Okay. Okay, so so I, just so I understand, I'm actually after opening up the question there to have a, have a look at it as well. Yes. So really what you're asking me is, what can this person do in terms of um, the suggestion that being leaned on may be getting in the way of the, the person themselves owning the condition? Okay, okay. So, you know, I think when we're supporting somebody over a long period of time, we can, be, it, we can almost become part of it. It's like what Mary was saying there about, you know, when Joe came home from hospital, people were ringing and saying, how's Joe, how's Joe? But nobody said, how's Mary? But Mary was, I'm going to use the word suffering, even though I dislike the word, but I'm going to use, Mary was experiencing as much distress almost as Joe was experiencing because she was carrying everything. And I think that can happen to a lot of people who are in caring roles. I think they can become as distressed as the person who's experiencing the depression or the bipolar in this case, because we're talking about aware. And I always remember reading something that, that Dr. Pat McKeown, the founder of AWARE wrote, where he said that when people are supporting a loved one with depression, depression and bipolar, up to 40% of them can become so depleted themselves that they also need help. And I think that's really important to hear. So when, we're, uh, when we have somebody leaning on us a lot, we can become depleted ourselves and we can actually take it on. And like that, that uh, person that asked that question was talking about preventing somebody else from owning it. And sometimes it can be hard to separate what's mine and what's somebody else's. But there are really, really good tools and techniques that people can use. And one of the tools we teach in the Relatives Program is the coping triangle, where we're looking at our thoughts, your own coping triangle, Claire. Nice. Our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And what we're doing is we're looking at the actions we're taking. What am I doing? What choices am I making? And the choices we're making are based on what we're thinking and what we're feeling, because they're all so connected. But it is possible for us to change some of our actions. And if we can take a step back, and consider our actions and maybe realize, well, I'm doing this because this is what I'm thinking, but is it helpful? Is what I'm doing helpful or is it unhelpful? Is what I'm doing actually preventing my daughter from owning it? Am I almost owning it for her? If it is, is that helpful or unhelpful? And maybe there's a small change we can make in the actions we take. So I don't know enough about this person's situation to be able to make suggestions of what actions can be changed, because that's very personal. It's very individual and everybody's circumstances are, 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 are different. But it's definitely worth looking at what am I thinking? What am I feeling? And what am I doing? And if I change something I do, will that change what I think and how I feel? Because we know from having worked with your coping triangle for a long number of years there, we know that it does make a difference. When we change something that we do, it impacts what we think and how we feel. It also means that we're just taking responsibility for our own actions and we're allowing another person 
take responsibility for things. Because sometimes we can take on other people's responsibility and that can disempower people to do things. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Bridget, maybe just the way I asked you to clarify festival for people who didn't know, if I just give yes. a, a quick synopsis of what the coping triangle is, it's yes. three, and it's lovely to hear you. That's why I was smiling to hear it back. Well, and to hear it used. So there's, it's my way of explaining, or where's a way of explaining the key principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are three steps. So the first is to catch what somebody's thinking, feeling, doing. The second is looking at four questions. So do our feelings make sense? Are our thoughts helpful? What do we believe because it might not be true and our actions helpful or unhelpful? And then the third step is what I now call the ABC coping sentence. So for this lady, I feel confused. I feel upset. I feel anxious because I think my daughter might be leaning on me too much. But I feel uncomfortable because I think if I don't let her lean on me, well, then who else has she? But I choose to get and take support. And what I find sometimes is, well, all the time, we do things because we feel better initially. So if we're sitting in the car and we think we didn't lock the front door, we'll go back and check because we feel better. But if we keep checking and checking and checking, then it's not helpful. So we can lean on people because we feel better, but then we can feel angry because we can think, well, we shouldn't have, to, we shouldn't need that support or we should be able to do it ourselves. And then parents and people who support others can feel better when they allow themselves to be leaned on because they might think, well, if I don't do it, there's nobody else. But then that can set up a dynamic where it can be really unhelpful. So look, that's a, a long detailed question for that lady. So I hope it's helpful. And just some of the other questions. Um, okay, and before you move yeah, on, can, very, I just add, can I just add in there just to remind people that every action we take is in an attempt to meet our need. Yes. So, you know, so I think sometimes people beat themselves up over things they do. But every time we do something, we're doing it because we're just trying to meet a basic need, whether that's survival or love and belonging or fun or freedom or power. It doesn't matter we're trying to meet a basic need. So yes. we can let ourselves, you know, we can allow ourselves that because we don't deliberately go out to do something that's difficult or wrong. We, we go out to do things to, to, to satisfy a need. It does it turn out to be helpful or unhelpful. That's a different story, but we are always trying to satisfy a need. The and Reed, what, you've, what you've just said in that response highlights the importance of self-understanding and compassion and kindness, yes, because kindness. I think in terms of what we do, we're really hard on ourselves. There's, there's a question here from a farmer, Joe and Mary, and somebody saying they'd enjoy the webinar. I'd like a copy of the festival, please. Actually, somebody else has asked that as well. That's on the AWARE website. And this person was down um, in County Limerick for, for a number of months looking after babies. So it's great to see how they move on after a few months. But um, some people weren't understanding of this person's difficulties with mental health. So what do you do? I just make sure I get the question right. Oh my goodness, there are a few more questions coming in here. So that one has just disappeared. So what do you do to support, there it is. What do you do, um, what could you do when you come to, um, would you agree with this? That it can be very difficult um, to deal with other people and when you can't explain what you're thinking or how you're feeling. And then there's another one, and I'm going to ask Jo and Mary this one um, where, as well, where someone doesn't accept that they have depression and they're waiting where they block their family out. Mm -hmm. And Jo and Mary, how you describe your partnership is that you were both from the word go very much supporting each other. And that, that comes across very clear. But I know from having spoken to you before this that you have, you're in the community supporting other people so have you come across a situation where somebody won't won't accept support and what do you suggest from your own yeah, experience but that's a, a good lot of people comes to us the two of us like we always when we meet someone it's always the two of us but uh, uh, and that's the first problem that we have is they won't accept that they have depression so i usually go through the way it affected me and they tell their story and it's usually very similar and i say to them look it's depression that's what I had was depression. And you have to make them believe that that's what they have. Um, can I just say that I suppose when I was in to St. Pat's and, and I wanted to learn as much as I could about depression and anxiety and the likes of that. But like when I was affected, I couldn't take it in. So um, uh, the two years afterwards, I'd done the, the life skills course through AWARE, and that was after meeting Breed at the Plown match, in fact, that, that um, I got involved in that. And like, I found it fantastic. But I was going to that when I was feeling well and well able to take it in. Um, 
when you're affected with 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 depression you can't take in these things and definitely you can't keep them in your head because you haven't forgotten uh, half an hour later and um look we, we we draw up a plan to try and keep keep me well i suppose and uh, uh, we make plans and in particular uh, i'm a great man now at booking holidays as, as soon as i come back from one i decide to book another one now only a couple of days away somewhere like you know and that uh, we're looking forward to something uh, all the time and uh, uh, also i suppose um, keep taking the medication when when i'm well uh, i think that's very important too many people that 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 come to me uh, that uh, and I have a couple of lads that have come back over the years and I find a minute to feel a bit better to stop taking the medication. And look, you, you have to have a plan for, for, for making yourself well. And exercise is definitely a, a, a big part of that. Um, I don't be the best myself to get out and walk. Mary is fantastic. But look, we try and talk to one another about it and say, look, maybe we need to do this or we need to do that. And coming to the springtime of the year now, it's always a plan uh, that look will we'll get better organized and that type of stuff. So making plans is very important. Mm. I would like to add to that as well that, um, you know, when people are willing, you know, are lost as to what's wrong with them and might just say, could we have a chat? Um, a lot of them say, well, look at, um, I didn't tell the wife that I'm, you know, coming to visit you or she doesn't want to hear about depression, kind of, you know, and that's hugely hard for us to hear because I do really think that it's it's certainly a couple's, you know, it, it's easier if, if the whole family is on the one page from the beginning and that... Um, so there would be several times that, you know, that stigma again is there that, oh, I don't want, to, you know, other family members to know I'm feeling like this. And, you know, then they can't help if, if you're not open enough to say, well, look, at, I'm feeling, you know, bad in myself. Uh, the negativity, of course, is, that, is one thing that will drag you down as well apart from maybe not sleeping properly or eating properly. Um, it's that mental language that Joe describes as swirling around in your head all the time that you, you can't, even though it could be the nicest, warmest, sunniest day, you will be searching for a black cloud somewhere. So some of the things I just jotted down, I do say um, it's always so important to stay on the medication prescribed by your GP. And particularly when you're feeling well, um, I also think it's hugely important and going from the farmer's point of view, again, farmers are no notorious for working from dawn to dusk. And, you know, I think routine has to be part of a structured day that, uh, and particularly with farming, that you have a finishing time in the evening where you physically change your clothes and maybe have a shower and have some downtime and not work until it's too dark to be doing jobs like. Um, I We both agree fully with that. And that would have been one change that we would have made after he'd been uh, in hospital in 2006. And we, also we, simple we, things like things that don't cost money, just have a bit of me time that if you want to look at telly, read a book, do a jigsaw, do a crossword, and hugely uh, get out in fresh air every day where you can appreciate seeing a bit of greenery around you, feel the wind in your face, even the rain, um, hear the Mary, birds say. I, I'm going to stop you there for a moment because I know you're talking about Joe and other people who are experiencing or have experienced depression in the past. And what you're saying would fit very much to anybody who is supporting them as well. But, but Joe has kind of answered my question in terms of how do you manage you know to keep keep well in terms of and the plans and and all of that mm. but from you from your point of view mary and i'm just conscious of time so how do you anxiety and depression can be very linked so do you have a sense of you're walking on eggshells you're watching joe if his mood is low or you're kind of dreading another episode or how do you mind yourself 
in support in continuing to support Joe? Because I know you do. Yeah, no, I, I certainly don't wake up every day worrying that, you know, is he and he he's honest and open enough. And we both have a, you have to have a sense of trust in the person. And he did say to me on occasions in intervening years, um, God, am I beginning to dip a bit? Did you notice anything? And, you know, so he is very open and it might be a minor blip, you know, for a week or two, but never, you know, sink to the depths of depression. But once he flags it and say, well, look, we'll, have, you know, we'll, we'll see, uh, just keep an extra uh, vigilance that, you know, I'm not slipping. Yeah, just, just one thing that, that, that Breed said, and I think of it all the time, is be kind to yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think as a farmer, we put shock and pressure on ourselves to do things exactly right and perfectionist and oh, you get all hit up if it's not done a hundred percent. And I always come back to that, be kind to yourself and let it go and let go of some of the anger and let go of some of the perfectionist. And sure, look, it's as good as I could manage and, yeah. and just leave it. So I think that's one thing I definitely have learned over the years. I, I just to give you feedback, I've got a um, response here. Very solid advice from Mary and Joe. Less is more. Small changes can make big differences. So I would just really echo that. And I want to thank you both very much. I want you to th say one thing that you would find is really important in supporting. And Breed, I have a particular question for you, just as we're, we're coming to an end. So, Joe, the thing that struck you, if you would say one thing in terms of supporting Mary, and in your journey and for other people to support the person who's supporting them from your perspective of having being unwell. Yeah, well, I think the one thing in supporting Mary is, uh, uh, I think, make plans together. I think that's very important. Okay, um, great. Thank you. I'm sorry for being short, Mary. Yet, friend, yeah. um, and like your communication is, is just, a, it's, it's, it's so obvious that you communicate really, really well. Mary, one thing that you've discovered in terms of supporting yourself that you could, pass on to other people yeah make time you know be it 20 minutes for yourself i find that hugely important now uh you know get out for a quick walk that's my way of um you know and i always come back feeling fresher and more energized but just give yourself that little bit of headspace um you know and from i always find it's it's hugely important to listen to Joe, you know, if he expresses, well, I don't feel as good today or, you know, anything, just take the time to listen. You needn't comment, you know, just listen. And particularly in those darker days, um, when he was willing to open up, you know, don't judge, don't give advice, just listen. And that can be a hard thing to do uh, initially, just to absorb all his problems, maybe on top of some of the anxieties that you're experiencing. Um, Mary, we haven't got a question, when is your book coming out? But I, I'm just anticipating that it could well do. Um, thank you both very, very much for your honesty, for sharing so much. And, and Breege, the question we have here, I think really sums up why AWARE, and you um, um, working with AWARE, developed the programme for relatives and people who care. It's, can Breege, please answer the question, how to deal with someone who doesn't want to be helped? Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> so there's a whole lot of old sayings coming into my head as you ask me that question. You can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink. Yeah. Unfortunately, if somebody doesn't want to be helped, it doesn't matter what you do. So what I can say is you can exhaust yourself trying to make them do something they don't want to do. And the person that becomes depleted is you. So I would be, have you ever been in a position where, where somebody else uh, is expressing that they know what's best for you? And they're saying, do you know what you need to do now is, I know when somebody says that to me, I'm gone. Because I'm saying, how do you know what I need? How do you know what's best for me? OK, sometimes we have to just allow people to get there in their own time. People do get there in their own time. But the most important thing 
for the person asking this question at this time is self-care for them. So going back to Joe's uh, comment about being kind, you know, and I'm back to the Buddhist philosophy of self-compassion, a kind and understanding attitude towards myself in times of emotional distress. So whoever asked that question, I'm going to speak directly to you. If you are feeling emotionally distressed at the moment because you're doing everything in your power to get your loved one to take help and they won't accept it, can you move some of that compassion towards yourself? Give yourself a little bit of time so that you're keeping your resources topped up. You're keeping your oxygen cylinder filled up because they will come to a time where they will accept help. And then when they want help, then you can be there, as opposed to being completely exhausted and flattened in the meantime. Reed, I, I completely agree with you, but if I can add in one thing I have found very helpful as well. Um, Harriet Lerner has written some books, The Dance of Anger, The Dance of Intimacy, The Motherhood Dance. And she talks about relationships like a dance. So if we've got a forehand wheel, we come in out in our turnaround and we've, we've all our steps and it yeah. works. But we can have a dance where we don't like it. We don't like our steps. We want to change it. So if someone is in the position of being lent on, if that's the right way to go, being leaned on yeah. and um, or being pushed or being the helper or whatever it is. And one person not not taking the water, not. But if we change our steps, well, then there's actually a new dance. So I think one of the best ways we can help someone who doesn't want to be helped in quotes is it's to just to help ourselves and then that actually can free up the situation breed yeah. very quickly one point you would like as a takeaway please uh for people who might be supporting a loved one mm -hmm. yeah i think you know taking time every day to look after yourself whatever that means that could mean going for a walk it could mean meeting a friend for a cup of coffee it could mean anything it could mean okay. sitting reading a book for 20 minutes okay taking Thank some you. time every day for self-care Thank you very much. And one of the questions we've had is about the benefit of going for a walk. And what I found is if somebody's going for a walk thinking, I shouldn't be out for the walk, I should be at home looking after this person, this isn't fair, then it's not as helpful as going, wow, this is great. Recognizing this is important for me to, as you say, to fill up my own oxygen tent so I can go back and I can give in a different way and managing the guilt that, you know, we, yeah. we all can and we, and we also know that when we exercise and go for a walk that we release endorphins, which are yes. kind of like happy chemicals in our system and that that also helps us to feel better. So it, it serves a double purpose. It's giving us yeah. headspace. It's giving us exercise, which is good for our mental and physical health. It's releasing endorphins and it's it's giving us a positive attitude. So it's hugely helpful. Back to the balance. Joe mentioned a Whereas Life Skills course. So I'd really like to take the opportunity to let the participants know that there are two courses coming up, opening the week of the 20th of September. One is the Relatives course. So, and the other is Aware's Life Skills. So Aware has two, what are called life skill courses. They're both courses that can, that do teach the basic principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. One is a development from Dr. Chris Williams in the UK. And the other one is Dr. John Sharry and his colleagues in Silver Cloud. So if people look at the Aware website, aware.ie, look up life skills registration is from the week of the 20th it's a six session group course the life skills online is an eight session one but the six weeks one is being done virtually at the moment and then breach the course that you're left you've left to wear but you'll never leave it and your legacy will be behind and the relatives courses are starting the relatives and friends course our registration again from the week of the 20th i would just heartfelt thank you mila buekas a thousand thanks to you mary parlin joe parlin and breach omara for your time your energy your compassion I know, and I and apologies to the people whose questions I haven't got to. And just to let you know that our next webinar series is, is um, we're doing something slightly different. Oh, apologies, registration for both programs are open now. So that's good news. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. So for the life skills and for the relatives and friends, they're actually open now. So if you'd like to go straight to the AWARE website. And just Karen is going to put up the next slide in terms of our next webinar because we're doing things slightly different for October because it's mental health week 
and we're going to have a series of webinars. So we're going to have three in a week rather than one, but they're going to be shorter. So those of you who are thinking, oh my goodness, they're going to be um, maybe 30, 35 minutes. The one on Monday, the 4th of October, back to basics recognizing depression and Breed, you've given us such a lovely reminder of what to look out for in that and the second one on the wednesday the 4th of october coping with depression and then friday the 8th depression and me and we will have people again talking about our lived experience perspectives and joe and mary you won't know the benefit of what you have said today the ripple effects there are people watching this who are going wow that person is just very much like the person who lives beside me or down the road and they will hear from you differently than anything Breach and no disrespect to you Breach, anything you no. Breach or I might say. So listen, Gurmila Mag of Galair and um, we'll leave it there and see you um, next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Joan Mary. Thanks. Bye now.